come before you. And again, thank you uh, for the time that we have to be in your house uh, for this evening service. I do pray that you'll be with our pastor, fill him with your Holy Spirit power, give him the unction from on high. And Lord, allow our hearts and minds to be open to the word of God as it's preached to us here. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good to have everyone back on this Sunday afternoon. And uh, I've heard that there is a football game that's being played. And I heard that everybody's supposed to be Cowboy fans today. Is that right? Oh, daggers flying in here now. This is 49er country, I guess. Amen. And uh, I did preach long this morning, so I do owe you some time. Don't know if I'll give it back to you today or not so that you'll get back. Amen. And if you hear somebody cheer in the background back there, that would mean uh, the 49ers scored. But that we probably won't hear those kind of cheers this afternoon. Are they starting at 3.30? Is that right, yeah. Eric? Is that That's why I didn't do the camera today. <laughs> Temptation for the, for the cameraman in the back. All right. So can... Confession has uh, started already, so it's going to be a good service there. Uh, if you will, find in your Bibles the book of Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah in chapter 10. And now we're just going to read a few verses uh, as we uh, uh, start out here. But we're looking at this, um, the idea of idolatry or idols. And uh, God speaks to the uh, fallacy of it here that if you can make something out of wood... And you can, in many places throughout the scripture, it talks about that. In one uh, port, portion of the scripture, it talks about where you uh, cut the tree down and you make your idol out of part of it and the rest of it, you know, you use this firewood to uh, cook your meat on. And it's like, you know, so how's that your God? And if you think about it, um, in Exodus, which is the second book of the Bible, I know thousands of years have passed uh, in uh, human history till that point. But you have where God in chapter 20 and verse 3 says, Make unto thee no graven image. We don't know what God looks like, so how would you make something if you're going to worship him and you make it in his image? You, you don't know what he looks like. So there's where you need to be very careful when you make things that you think and you're using that as an object to worship God. But when you think about false religions, you see that many times there's statues, there's idols. You can walk up to people's homes and you can see what they have there. And they have made what they think their God looks like. But once again, if it's made out of a piece of wood and it's nailed down, screwed down, whatever it may be, and if they need to move it to the uh, opposite side of the house or they need to move it somewhere, they have to pick it up and move it. How's that God going to help you? in your life when you're not even around. And we'll look at these verses uh, here in just a little bit, but just to try and set you this mindset, as you read through especially the Old Testament, you're going to see that the Israelites were always getting caught up in idolatry. They're always going to make them something. You know, in cha Exodus chapter 20, you had God said, don't make any graven images. And in Exodus chapter 32, what did they do? They broke off the earrings. They threw it into the fire. And I liked the way that Aaron said, and, oh, and out come this golden calf. And it's kind of like, wow, miraculous. And see, in any time that somebody wants to do, make a fake God, they're always going to have to add a miracle in there because... The Lord Jesus Christ is the only one that can do miracles. But if you're wanting to have a God, you have to ascribe to them false miracles. And so there's a pattern in human history. People that are to worship God, they always try to change it instead of just going along with what he says. And you're like, well, you know, we're in the New Testament. And we don't have to worry about that. Well, why is it that in 1 John chapter 5, the last verses says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. We're no different from the Israelites. Now, we might not make a graven statue. We might not uh, uh, make something out of wood and gold-plated or silver-plated and bow down to it. But what's in your life that keeps you from worshiping God truly? That's an idol. Sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's time, but most of the time it's your attitude. 
And see, and you're going to conjure up this God in your mind that says, I can do whatever I want to do because that's how I am. And if it's against what the Lord Jesus Christ has said, you've made an idol. And that's who you're going to have to call upon when you're in the hospital or someone else is in the hospital. A halfway God. A God that doesn't care about sin. Do you really want a God that doesn't care about sin, that's okay with your sin? If he's okay with your sin, then he has to be okay with their sin too. And what happens when their sin costs you? So I've just about preached the old message right there. We could have an invitation right now, but that wouldn't be quite right, would it? So stand with me, and we'll look in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse number 1. And many times this passage of Scripture is used by people that don't think that you should have a Christmas tree. And if you're the type of Christian that says, I would never have a Christmas tree, you're okay. But don't make your not having a Christmas tree make you a better Christian than the person that says, well, it's just a tree. I don't bow down and worship it. I just throw the gifts under it, and man, after Christmas, we throw it out in the street or we throw it in the dumpster. It's just a tree. It's just the decoration, right? It's no different from a red tie or a green tie or a dress or a pants. Boy, we start putting those kind of stuff on there, and we can make idols ourselves pretty quick. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 1 says, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth the tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as a palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you this evening, and we just humbly ask that you'd open the eyes of our understanding and help us to search ourselves, Lord, to see that we're not making some idols out of some things that we believe that we would maybe even get from, from Scripture. Father, that we would not set ourselves up to be better than others. But Lord, that we would take a good hard look at our lives and realize that some of the things that you've said are not for us. But Lord, there are some things that you have said for all people, and we need to obey them. Father, give us wisdom as we come in and go out, and as we rightly divide your word, that what does apply to us, Lord, we would let it work in our lives, and we would submit unto you. And Father, I pray that you fill me with your Holy Spirit and lead me and guide me here this evening and help us to beware of idols that we would not set any up in our lives and worship them rather than you because you're the only one that should be worshiped. Thank you for loving us. It's in Christ Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Now, you've already seen here real quick, and what God says is they are upright as a palm tree, verse 5. But speak not, they must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. And it's amazing how when people make an idol, they're expecting it to do good. Boy, this is what's going to keep me from, how about the lucky rabbit's foot? Hey, if that rabbit got killed, he ain't very lucky himself, is he? Yeah. So why and then would you want to hold on to that? So be very careful with those things. The, the false religions will always set those kind of things up. Be careful. You know, we've got the Native Americans, and they've got the totem poles. You know, and they've got other things that they uh, have and they use in worship. And then sometimes people uh, try to just use those things because they think it's something good. And so they'll bring in things of Native Americans into their homes and use that as decorations. Be careful with that. Because that's something that's made to a false god. Well, see, we need to be careful that we don't bring in things that seem um, like there's nothing to it and we bring it into our homes. I think the worst thing, and I'm, I'm just as guilty of this as everybody else. Maybe not everybody else. There'd be some people that not this way. 
I think the worst thing that we, a Christian ever brought into their home is the TV. It's a one-eyed devil. But you would be looked at as being crazy if you don't do that. But you know, if the electricity went off, none of our TVs would work. Yeah. See, in a lot of things that we have, and a lot of things that are in modern day, and remember, we're looking at modern uh, churches. And so when you look at modern churches, you're going to have to look at the false cults also, because some of the major false cults that are alive and well in America today weren't even in existence 200 years ago. So we're in the last days from that where there's a whole lot of knowledge going around, but there's a whole lot of fake stuff going around too. And when you think of uh, the Latter-day Saints or you think of Jehovah's Witnesses, they weren't around 200 years ago. Oh, there was some seeds of false doctrine that they kind of uh, took and adopted themselves. That's always been around. But to have an organized system, can you imagine if the false cults, just with the uh, Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness, if those people had not got caught up in something false, but yet they had followed the truth, look how much different our country would be today. Look how many, and just off the top of your head, if you're somebody that pays attention in politics, how many politicians, if they, if they weren't of a false cult, but they would be a born-again Christian, look how many of them you would know that they're born-again Christians. I know of many that claim to be a Mormon, but very few politicians have I ever heard to claim that they're born again. But being born again is Bible. And Jesus said, ye must be born again. See, and we've just gone along with this stuff. Well, we don't have to let it come in our church, and you don't have to let it come into your home, but you need to be aware of it. And God's warning us here, and seeing you have a lot of fundamental believers, and what they're going to say is from Jeremiah chapter 10 here, because I've had people use this passage of Scripture and say, oh, so you shouldn't have a Christmas tree. Okay, shouldn't have a Christmas tree, but you ought to tithe 10%. Come on. And you ought to go soul winning. Come on. And uh, you ought to have a discipleship program in your church. And you shouldn't be so arrogant about yourself. And why are you so caught up in yourself in the way that you dress and the way that you do things, but you look down on other people that don't? We can get pretty self-righteous about, well, we don't do this and we don't do that. And we need to be careful of that. I need to be careful of that. My righteousness does not come by what I do or don't do. My righteousness comes from Christ Jesus, and it's imputed. And then I ought to live a life of righteousness and a life of godliness as much as I can. And when I figure out through the study of God's Word or through the preaching of God's Word that, man, that's, I'm not doing so good there, you know, I'll take steps to get rid of it. Okay? Does that make sense? Everybody good? We're just trying to help you here tonight. That's not trying to, you know, if you've got idols at home, hey, you know, I'm not going to come around and look into your refrigerator and see what you're, not going to come over and check the last channel on your TV and see what you're watching there. I'm not going to see, oh, what movies that you got there. But if you're convicted by it, you ought to get rid of it. That's right. You're like, well, pastor, you just talking like you're convicted of TV every time I watch it. Are you convicted every time you get bitter? Come on. Are you convicted every time that you want to hear something? Come on. It, it, here's, here's, a, here's a fact, okay? It takes two to gossip. Yeah. It's always somebody wanting to hear. Come on. Oh, I've never seen anything, but boy, you sure listen. Right. It's good. You're like, well, how do I stop the person from talking to me? Tell them shut up. I mean, tell them be quiet. I don't want to hear that. That's gossip. Good. When you do that and you shut somebody down, then you're not the gossip. Boy, quiet in here now. But we all like to hear things about how somebody else is doing, don't we? And then what do we do? We compare ourselves one to another. Well, I'm okay with God because I'm not like them. Ooh, you just set an idol up because none of us. There's none righteous. No, not one. 
they've all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. You're like, but I'm in church. I understand that, and you need to realize worshiping God's a good thing. But that's not what gets you into heaven. Yeah. See, there's a, there's a lot of things that we could look at here and a lot of things that we could bring up. But you need to make sure that how you worship God, you, if, you, if you've made an idol out of him, that's who you're going to have to live with and that's who you're going to have to deal with. Sometimes people can make an idol that's not a softy. They can make their God to be out, to be so unmerciful and so unkind that nobody could ever be right with him. That's the side of the spectrum that you have to watch. See, that's the people that say, oh, no Christmas trees. See, raise your hand. I think Bible Baptist used to be a no Christmas tree church. Am I right or wrong? Somebody help me. I remember when we got here, we merged the two churches together and I have Christmas tree. And I remember somebody that complained one time about pumpkins being handed out to kids at Halloween. And that person and their family didn't turn out so well. But they were so self-righteous over giving out a stupid pumpkin to kids. We didn't carve them. We didn't paint them up. We just gave them out because they were cheap. Okay, we weren't celebrating Halloween. It'd been a whole lot better if that home would have had some righteousness in it instead of self-righteousness in it. They ain't turned out so well. Proof's in the pudding. Yeah. Hate to say it. Well, I'm not worried about them watching. They're not watching. They're probably not even in church. And hopefully it'll be some help to them. I already mentioned about Exodus chapter 20, talking about don't make unto thee any graven image. Turn with me here so that you see that in 1 John in chapter 5. 1 John in chapter 5. It's just kind of, it, it's odd that it's there. Why, why would John say that? He's gone through all of these things. He said, if we walk in the light, uh, we have fellowship uh, with the Lord. We can confess our sins. But 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. I wonder why he would add that in. It's just a short statement, just a short sentence that's there. But he's telling us, look, be careful that you don't make idols. Now, what, what's the idol that you're going to make? You're going to make the one that lets you get away with what you do, but it holds everybody else accountable for what they do. That's self-righteous. And that's an idol that I need to watch out for. Because then if I'm that way and I have a heart like that, then when I call upon God, God's going to say, well, wait a minute. I can't answer your prayer because I can't answer their prayer. You know, it's not one of those battles that goes back and forth. God just knows how to rightly divide our thoughts also. And if you're out of a pure heart and you're just through ignorance making a mistake, God will be merciful to you. But it's when you set yourself up as a judge and you start judging other people, that's when he's going to start judging you. It's something about with uh, whatever meet, you meet somebody else, the judgment that you have towards somebody, that's how you're going to be judged. That's the scales, the balances that he's going to use. Go with me back now to Ezekiel. Chapter 13, Ezekiel in chapter 13. You wouldn't think that God's people, with all the miracles that God had done, all the times that they've warned him, but I'm telling you, as you read through the history of Israel, you're just going to see that they always got caught up in something false. They always did that which was right in their own eyes. They're always trying to do these, uh, they're always looking for the new better thing or the thing that's going to work out in this day and age. And that's what we're running into with our modern churches and because they have a crowd, because they appeal to people. I wonder how many people are at a football game today. I wonder how many people are going to be in the stadium. I wonder how many people are going to watch the service live, I mean the game, live streamed. And so, who, I'm, 
I'm not preaching to you guys here at church now, okay? You go home, watch the game, watch the game. Eric. <laughs> But it's a whole lot of people joined together there, and is that a godly event? No. So crowds don't mean anything, does right. it? It's good. Now, would it be nice if we had a crowd like that? Could we? It, it, it would. It would bless my heart to see in America today stadiums filled like Billy Graham used to fill them. It's too bad that he wasn't teaching the truth and preaching the truth all the way and stayed separated. And that would have continued on and have a more lasting effect. But it always gets watered down. Just gets watered down just to get the bigger crowd. Be careful with that. So you're in um, Ezekiel chapter 13. Look with me, we'll start reading in verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, Hear ye the word of the Lord. So what's God saying here? You watch out for people that are just talking about godly stuff, but they're only telling you what comes out of their hearts. Verse number 3, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. These are people that write books, sell books, and people buy their books because they think that that's going to help them to be a better Christian. It's amazing how so much in Christianity today has been all around books that were written by people that maybe they're saved, but boy, they sure cast a false impression of who God is and not His holiness. They don't focus on God's holiness. They focus on, well, you can have your best life now. You can be blessed by God right now. And then if that doesn't work out, well, you must not have had faith. Be very careful with those kind of things. Verse number 14. O Israel, thy prophets are like foxes in the desert. Ye have, uh, ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither have uh, made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. See what he's telling here? Other people, they're talking to other people, and they give them a hope, but it's a false hope. Verse number 7, Have ye not seen a vain vision, and have ye not spoken a lying divination? Whereas ye say, The Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. And my hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel, neither shall they enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord God. You're like, well, pastor, how does, how does God work against these people that are preaching false doctrine and preaching false things? Where are their grandchildren at? Be very careful with that. And they start uh, uh, teaching false doctrines and name it and claim it kind of stuff and put all that up there. And they like, well, this is what God would have us to do. How's that turn out for their kids? Now, for our kids, doesn't mean that your kids are going to turn out right because you bring them to church every Sunday and then you have a home that's conducive uh, to godliness and holiness. It's still their choice. They still have to make the conscious choice to follow God the same way that we do. But when you train them up the wrong way and you present the false thing to them, what are they going to do? They're going to follow it. And next thing you know, you have a whole group of people that say, look, you don't need to go to church on Sunday night. Ah, midweek service? Ah, nobody wants to go to that anymore. If it was me and my family be the only ones here on Thursday night, we'd have a Thursday night service. And we've done that before. You're like, well, you wouldn't do it for very long. Do as long as we needed to. You're like, what about Sunday morning? 
if there's one or two gathered in the name of the Lord? Why do you have to have a crowd? Have you made the crowd, the other people that are here, your idol, and you only feel? I understand. You come into a church service, and there's hardly anybody here, and you're like, oh, man, where's my hat? Or you come in, there's visitors, and there's people here, and people, you know, say, whoo, praise the Lord. Man, it's good to be here. Well, Georgie Davis has been gone for a few years, but I'm still here. Yeah. Come on. But a lot of people rode on her coattails because she was excited about the things of God, because she served God, because she was praying. Wait a minute, Georgie's dead. She's in heaven. And what you have, if it's not real, if it's a fake idol, it's going to show up in your life. But if you have something that's real, that's going to keep you going. And if we impart to our kids something that's real, they're going to hold on to that. They might walk away from it, but when they're old, they'll not depart from it. And be careful how you use that verse also. Second Timothy, you don't need to turn there. Second Timothy in chapter 4 and verse 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Those major religions that we've talked about, ones like uh, they deal with something on the seventh day and the other ones, the Latter-day Saints and then the JWs, they're all dealing with fables. They all twist the scriptures to their own destruction, but boy, they have a lot of crowds. Some of them have nice property. It's amazing how a lot of them dress right. A lot of them pretty successful. But they've only been around 200 years. That ought to make it, that ought, man, I, want, I want the same belief system that John the Baptist had. Right. Yeah. I want to do what Jesus taught. Yeah. I want the same thing that Peter and Paul had. I, I want what Moses had. I want what Elijah and Elijah, Elisha had. It's good. Man, I want to sit at Isaiah's feet and listen to him, what God's given him. I want to read the book of Jeremiah and see where he was thrown into prison, but he didn't give up. I want to read where Jeremiah said, man, I'm not going to say nothing anymore. Yeah. But then something started to burn. Yep. See, there it comes back to the study of Scripture. If you'll study it, God's going to stir your heart, and you're going to be on fire. Good. Sometimes you might need to add a few more pieces of wood to the fire, but you'll be all right. Man. Look with me now in chapter 33, Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. <clears throat> I wrote these down for you. Let's see if I can find it here in my notes. Uh, the word idols in Scripture are, turn, uh, are in 95 verses. doesn't mean that it might not show up a couple times in, each, uh, in one verse, but 95 times. The word idol is 35 times. Idolatry is five times. So throughout the Scripture, 113 verses deal with idolatry, idols. Man, that's kind of like, why would idols be in there? You know, we're, we're talking about the true God. Wow, that's somebody that set up an idol. They'll come listen to God's word, but they won't do God's word. We need to be careful with that, don't we? Look in verse number 32. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this cometh, cometh to pass, lo, it will come. Then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. God's given a warning. Remember, Ezekiel is in captivity. Ezekiel is amongst a people and prophesying to a bunch of people that because of idolatry and turning their back on God, they're now in captivity for a minimum of 70 years. They no longer have Jerusalem. They no longer have a temple. All they have is a foreign country that they're in. And yet they still want to hear the word of God, but they won't do it. 
what will it take for you to come to the place to where you'll just obey God? It really ought to come down to just the love for the Lord. It doesn't matter. Um, it does matter what you do for God, how you live for Him. But it's amazing how we've gotten to the place to where, well, you know, uh, what kind of music do you have at church? Well, well, if we had no music, would that change anything? We didn't have a piano player today. Eric would certainly like to have had a piano player. But does that mean that God didn't meet with us? That God's word's not the same? Because we didn't have a musical instrument? Well, what if, Pastor, if you know, that's the same kind of thing there, then why don't we have more instruments? If one's good, if a piano's good, why don't we have some electric stuff and some, you know, guitars and drums and all that kind of stuff? And so the God that you worship likes rock and roll? That's just something to consider. Do you think that God's well pleased? Do you think he would want you? Would he want to listen to rock and roll music? Oh, yeah, the words are all about him. Yeah, I've heard him take Hotel California and put Christian words to it. And that pastor today is in jail. Praise the Lord. Pretty sad. Now, are we right because we have a hymn book? No, we're right when it's coming from our heart. Jesus loves me, this I know. I bet that song touches his heart. I bet just as I am touches his heart too. When you realize what that song means to you. It's not what you, it's not what you're doing or not doing. It's why you're doing it. Why are you here? Well, I'm just here because mom and dad make me then you've got a God that's not real to you. Yeah. And there's too many children that grow up in good Christian homes, go to Christian school, Christian education, and it's never, God's never real to them. He's a fake idol. And then we have adults that are in church and stay in church. But God's okay with them just coming to church and never getting anything right. Never forgiving someone or being forgiven. Their God is okay with how they dress. Their God is okay with their offerings. Their God's okay with their lack of soul winning. Their God's okay with their Bible reading. How much Bible would God want you to read? That'd be a question you need to put to him. How much would he want you to pray? I think he gave us that answer, didn't he? Without ceasing. But see, we serve a God, most of us, that's okay if we only pray every once in a while. And then you expect him to answer. Come on, remember the illustration? Oh, God, come out now and give me three wishes. He's not a genie. He's a holy, righteous God. And we should treat him that way. Get the idols out and get him in view. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Altar's open if you need it.
Let's all stand together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your life and your ministry to mankind. Lord, I pray that you would watch over us and protect us from false doctrine, false practice. Help us to not have idols in our lives. Lord, any of us that struggle with things that we give more precedent to it than to you. God, thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us with every breath that we have that we can get things right with you. Thank you that all we need to do is confess our sin and, Lord, then walk with you. Thank you for being so good to us and loving us. We pray for those that are sick in our church. Lord, pray for others that are dealing with physical things, even today, taking a fall. We pray that you would heal their bodies, restore their health to them. And Lord, that we would have everyone gathered back together soon. Thank you, Lord.